Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Look at all these people. Welcome to Pan X 219, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Sean Smithson. I used to write in a magazine called Fangoria for a few years. Uh, I was also at Screen Anarchy, formerly known as Twitch Film. And uh, currently I'm with Diabolique Magazine and Movie Maker. And what an honor to sit with two of my favorite actors. Oh my gosh. Mr. Silverman, Mr. Patrick, welcome. We'll get started. I know there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to keep my end of things short. Again, please line up at the mic and I'll get to you very soon. I guess the, the simple one first is, how the heck did you start with Lost Boys? And I know that the original screenplay was a lot different than originally what was shot. For me, it, it, was, a, it was a very standard practice. Uh, you went on the audition, uh, I was lucky enough to get the part, and, uh, and we went and made the film. Uh, the only thing that I've ever found disappointing about that entire experience is that I was so young when I was making it that I didn't realize how fortunate I was to be a part of that project. And so, uh, but it was one of the great summers of my life making that film. To you? Jason bought his way into it. Did you buy your way into it? <laughs> you know, it was the same thing. Uh, and back in the 80s, things were a lot different than now. And sometimes you just go to meet people to just get your name out there. And so I really didn't have an intention of doing the movie. But there was a very famous casting director named Marion Dougherty, who had worked for a long time at Warner Brothers. I think she found James Dean way back. And so I just wanted to meet her. And then it, it rolled into something else. So you guys are young and pretty darn beautiful. You still are. You're running around making a feature film in Santa Cruz, California. I'm from that area. I know there's got to be a story or ten, man. What was it like? What can you tell us? You know, it, again, I just have to plead the fifth and tell you I was really young. I, I, I do remember funny stuff like Jason and I uh, were tired of eating at the commissary at, Warner Brothers, at the Warner Brothers lot. And so one day we decided to just go out and find a restaurant and get something different to eat. And we were in full vampire makeup. <laughs> And I think we'd had it on for so long, we kind of forgot about it. And we were sitting in the car, and he's at a red light, and these two girls, really pretty girls, pulled up beside us. And we looked and smiled, and waved at them, thinking that they would maybe go out with us. We were in the full makeup, and they, I think they called us a bunch of names, and called us disgusting, and took off. Uh, so it was just, it was, it, was, it was a funny time. You know, it was, uh, Jason always did better with the girls than I did. Um, Not always, just most of the time. But, but we, we just, uh, again, it was just one of those things that, I, looking back on it, I wish I knew how lucky I was to be a part of something that was going to have the longevity that that film has had. Boy, has it. Wow. Jason, I know that in high school you were in a production of Dracula. That's possible. <laughs> what role did you play? Uh, I mean, I, not Dracula, so whoever the other guy was. Um, I just remember that the girl playing, I believe, Mina was quite attractive. It's the only memory I have. Do we have questions at the mic? Please. Hello. Hey. Welcome to Utah. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is for Kiefer is a Young Guns 2 question. So... <laughs> The premise of the movie is obviously that Billy the Kid has survived his, you know, ordeal, Pat, yeah. Pat Garrett orde ordeal and made it through to live a life. I'm just curious, you being in the film and studying all those things, what is your take on that? Do you think that he survived that or what's your, what's your answer? Thank you. Well, there was certainly an argument that was being made, uh, not only in the context of our film, but historians uh, have often thought that because Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett were such good friends at one time, that his death was actually staged. And so, for us, certainly making the sequel, uh, it was a great narrative for us to take on. Uh, I, I tend to lean on the, the historical sense that Billy the Kid was actually killed by Pat Garrett. But for our purposes, uh, it worked out great. And there were, there was historical, certainly 
Doc Skurlock, the character that I played, had come back from New York to New Mexico. Uh, and there were sightings of him at that time period. So, uh, But it's, it's a version of history, and I would leave it at that. Next question. Hi, um, I'm asking this for my husband, Alex. Um, so let's say, hypothetically, the world's gonna end in, I don't know, 24 hours? And uh, not even Jack Bauer can do anything about it. Um, so my husband wants to know, in this situation, what would you eat your last, last day on our What would I eat? Yeah, for both of you, what would you eat? For me, it would be a really big glass of scotch and I would eat all of it. <laughs> Uh, most likely the girl who poured the scotch. <laughs> that's the story of our relationship. <laughs> Next question. Yep. Uh, well, guys, thanks for, for coming, and uh, we really appreciate it. And my question is, when you were filming The Lost Boys, uh, what were some of the most like fun times or some of the best uh, elements uh, of uh, filming it? Um, well, th there are a lot of them. I tend to remember the stupid ones. Uh, we were on the motorcycles on the boardwalk, and there was a girl that I saw on the set that I thought was really pretty, and I was kind of starting to show off for her. And I did a wheelie down the boardwalk, and I hit a train track uh, for a trolley car that I had never seen before. Anyways, the bike went that way, I went that way, and broke my wrist in three places. And so for the rest of the movie, I'm wearing black gloves, and you'll see on my motorcycle, there's a clutch and a brake on the same hand, because the other one was just glued in to the, to the handlebar. And I remember Jamie Gertz getting back on the bike with me. Uh, my hand is in a cast, it's glued to the steering wheel, and she said, can you actually ride the bike like this? And I said, I don't know, we'll find out, and then off we went. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of stuff like that that I remember. Uh, well, you know, I just asked the girl if she wanted to have a drink. It seems simple. <laughs> That's right. As far as the filming, uh, the makeup, my, my buddy Marcel is a professional effects makeup guy, works on The Walking Dead. He wanted me to ask you, what was the most painful part? The contacts, the bangs? Contacts. Contacts. Because, uh, they look brutal. Yeah, they were, they were full, uh, hard um, uh, plastic. I mean, now, for the most part, people do CGI eyes, but these things were full, and, and they had to numb your eyes with a drop to put them in, and there was doctors on set, and you could only wear them for 15 minutes, or you, or you could uh, suffer serious damage from your, your, your eyeball drying out. Um, and it was difficult, M more difficult for Kiefer, because he had to hang upside down with them. <laughs> Next question. Hi, Kiefer. Um, I wanted to know what it was like for you on set with Forsaken, with your dad. It was awesome. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that I've wanted to do for decades. I've wanted to work with my father, not only because I think he's one of the greatest actors uh, in the world, but Colin, we're going to get that. Thank you very much. And, uh, but I wanted to spend the time with him. Uh, and, and so for all of those reasons, it was fantastic. Uh, the only thing that, that was kind of awkward was we have a very similar sounding voice and I'm like a shorter version of him, but we kind of look alike and there were moments where I was, I would forget that I was in a scene with him because I was trying to watch him work and I would f go, oh, shit, that was my line, right, okay, we have to do that again. So I remember watching him a lot uh, in that, in that circumstance that is very different than any other actor I've ever worked with. But it was it was a really special time for me. Can I ask you what you may you may have learned from your father as an actor and as working with him as a peer? <laughs> um, well I think one of the th yeah I'm gonna hold on to that. I think one of the things that, that I did take away is that you can never be over, overly prepared. Uh, his ability to own dialogue and know the dialogue backwards and forwards, uh, he, he is so prepared as an actor uh, that that really just serves you, especially if 
uh, the blocking of a scene has to change because of a location or a, a set, uh, the more familiar you're with the, the text, the better off you are. I'd imagine that serves you well, especially doing broader stuff like genre stuff where you have to sell something fantastic. For, well. for me, it does. I mean, there's, there's other actors that have a philosophy that if they're barely holding on to it, it creates a kind of energy for them. I don't subscribe to that. And, and, and I really don't now after watching my father uh, at work. Awesome. Next question. Do we have another question? Yes. So I was wondering, because you guys were in one of the first um, teenage vampire movies, how you feel about how that has taken off in the past couple of years? With like stuff like Twilight and... Yeah, what's your personal opinion on the newer movies when you guys were one of the first? <laughs> I, I, first of all, I, I, you know, the idea of telling a story about a bunch of characters that will never die uh, and the consequence of how they survive is to take the lives of others. It's, it's going to be a story that's going to be told a thousand years from now, as it was told 200 years before us. Um, you know, I, I, I think all of, I think it's an interesting genre. I think it's an exciting story to tell, and the people that have told them, I, you know, some have done it better than others. Uh, but it's certainly not something that I feel, and I, I can actually speak for Jason on this, that we can actually lay claim to. Uh, vampire stories have been told for a very long time and they will be told many years down the line and, and I would hope, every, you know, I would wish anybody who's going to tell that story to do it really well. Your yeah. Bless your heart. Thank you. Cheers. And I love your hair. Thank you. So my question is kind of related. Um, you grew up with a dad who's very popular and, and very handsome and an actor in the industry. And I don't know that your dad was an actor, so how is it growing up in different lifestyles? I didn't grow up with my dad. I grew up with my mom in Canada and Toronto with my twin sister. My dad lived in Los Angeles. Uh, I would see him at Christmas, you know, every other year, and I would spend some time with him over the summer. Uh, one of the most interesting kind of moments that I had with my father is because when I was growing up, his films you couldn't just walk to the theater and watch them because they were restricted and I was a kid. So I wasn't as aware of my father's success as an actor until uh, I was about 18 and I could rent the DVDs of his movies. Uh, and I remember I called him and I felt like a really bad son because I had watched in I think three days, I would watched MASH, uh, Don't Look Now, 1900, Kelly's Heroes, Ordinary People, uh, Fellini's Casanova, Bertolucci's 1900. And, and the cross-section of his work was so extraordinary that I phoned him and told him, I'm so sorry that I didn't know how important you were as an actor. And he was very sweet. He laughed and he said, how could you? And so it was really at that point that we started to develop kind of our relationship. Uh, so as for the other thing, you know, certainly when I moved to Los Angeles, Sean Penn's father was a director, Matthew Broderick's father was a director, Tim Hutton's father was a writer. Uh, all of those guys had grown up kind of in Malibu and in the business. Uh, I had not, and Jason hadn't really either. Uh, you know, his father was a wonderful writer, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1973, but you were separated from that as well. So, so that actually served me really well, was that my experience of making movies and that, was, was a fresh, new experience. It wasn't something that was kind of a reflection of something that I'd watched all my life through my father. That's a long answer, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a great answer, and I love hearing you talk about your father in movies like Don't Look Now and Puerto Reaches, and I love that stuff. Um, Jason, I'd like to acknowledge also uh, your family. I mean, your father, as Keeper mentioned, is an award-winning playwright. He's also the star of my favorite movie ever, The Exorcist. He plays Father Damien Garris. I saw him five years old by accident. Um, like all his other work too, your grandfather is Jackie Gleason, for heaven's sake. Um, have you ever had a chance to work with any of you? And your brother, jo your half-brother Joshua, is an amazing screenwriter and also an actor at times. Have you had a chance to work with any of your family or have there ever been any plans for that? 
Uh, have I had a chance? No, um, but eight years ago, Kiefer and I were on Broadway and we did the uh, uh, revival of championship season. So, in a sense, you know, um, uh, I was working with his greatest piece of material. And, uh, you know, it's something that Kiefer and I hadn't seen each other probably in almost 20 years. And then to work together in something like that, you know, we got to sort of rebond. And, you know, for that, I'm uh, very thankful to the spirit of my father, wherever he may be. Yeah. You also did Streetcar Named Desire. I know you also did Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway. Oh, really? Well, I had that wrong. Now I'm embarrassed. Uh, sorry. But I can still ask my next question, and then we'll get to this young gentleman here who's being so patient. Um, I like to ask actors, especially in this day and age of, like, YouTube fame and stuff like that, where do you put the importance of training now as an actor? Again, going back to being prepared and being able to sell such broad material you put on a cape, it's not easy to act out, out of that cow. Um, I'd like to hear what you gentlemen think about training and maybe... Well, for me, I, I feel bad for young actors right now. When, when we started, there was a rule of thumb that you, if you had a successful film, you had seven more opportunities. And so you can make six films that aren't successful, but as long as the seventh one was, you got a whole nother seven. That doesn't exist now. You can have someone who's successful in three films, and if the fourth one isn't successful, they're done. You know, you can go to theater school, and you can train with a, a, a private teacher if you want, but the reality is, the process of working as the greatest coach. And I don't think young talent is given enough time to develop uh, in the industry that exists today. Uh, and hopefully that will change over time. But, uh, but I think that the training uh, that really makes actors, I think, go from having great potential to potentially being great uh, is the experience of being able to fail. Uh, and I don't think we, as an industry, allow young performers that opportunity. Well said. And also, Jason, I'm sorry, I'm a cat on a hot tin roof. Okay. <sighs> Redemption. You've been so patient, dude. You get to ask two questions if you want. Thank you. Um, this is for both of you. Um, did you guys have stage fright, and how did you overcome it? Great question. Uh... Right. Um, you mean doing doing a movie or something like yeah. that in front of other people? Sure. When you're younger, um, I remember the first thing I did was this TV movie with uh, Bruce Dern and Lee Remick back in '85 or something. And I had taken an acting class before that, maybe a year before that. And there was an older actor there who had come from a lot of stage, and he talked about making peace with the camera because the first time he was on camera, and he said in the late 40s, it was like this beast that was watching him that he couldn't get out of his mind. He was getting in the way of the other actors. I mean, when you see us in a movie with a close-up and they cut back to the woman, you assume we're looking at them. Of course we're not. We're looking at something that, that looks like this with all these people. But the camera he found invasive. And he, I remember he said he had to make peace with the camera. So that very first day I think I worked on that movie, it was lunchtime and everyone went to lunch and we were filming upstairs in this house and the camera was there just sitting there in this sort of darkened room. And I remember just sitting in a chair like this and just for about an hour just staring at this camera, just saying, look, I just want to help you. I need your help as well, <laughs> in my mind. And, and in a strange way, from that moment, I sort of made peace with that. So whatever nervousness I had, I felt I sort of had a little uh, uh, a comrade in that camera. But stuff still comes up, of course, but that was, that's what I wanted. For me, when we were do, we did a play together on Broadway called That Championship Season, and we did 200 plus performances of that show. The 210th one, I was as nervous that night as I was the first one. So I do get very nervous, and you figure out how to take that energy and that nervous energy and make it work for you. Before we would do the play, Jason, the play would open and Jason would be on stage by himself and I would be off in the wings and every night and every single night he would be pacing around the chair I would come down and sit in my chair 
about 15 minutes before the curtain would rise. We would walk to the center of the stage, shake each other's hands, wish each other luck, go back and start to think about what you had to do. Uh, those kinds of rituals make you a little at peace, but, but if you ever go to do a play or perform music or anything like that, know that if you're a little nervous, that's good. If you're not, you might be in trouble. <laughs> Turns into energy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a second one? Because you were so <laughs> you were so patient. It's okay. <laughs> See, you're awesome. You're awesome. I have hope for the future. Hi guys. Um, so this is a question for Kiefer. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Designated Survivor. Thank you. Um, I watched that show on repeat. No spoilers, please. I'm not done with it yet. Um, um, I have a question. When, what was your favorite part shooting the past few seasons? Well, I, th I think certainly, and, and, and I'm going to heed the, the request to not get into politics, but I think and, and it's not about one specific person, but I think we're living in a time, and I think social media is a large part of it, where there's, there's a kind of meanness out there that, uh, that I think is really unfortunate. And I think one of the nice things about doing Designated Survivor, and, and certainly from the writer's perspective about writing Tom Kirkman, was that they really made an effort to create a character that was going to view things in a compassionate way. And I think, we live in a society that, I, I have to be honest, I think our society is less compassionate now than it was 25 years ago. I think our ability to understand the struggles or someone else's opinion uh, has gotten less. And so it was wonderful to do a show about a guy and a staff at the White House that was really trying very hard uh, to work from a place of compassion. And I would say that was my favorite thing about the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go for it. Uh, so, out of this is for both of you guys. One, I love you. Two, uh, for every character that you guys have ever played, who's your favorite? <laughs> for me, I think. David in The Lost Boys is certainly the one that people talk to me the most about. Mm -hmm. uh, my answer to your question would be, I hopefully I haven't played him yet. <laughs> um, and Jack Bauer was, was the gift of a career, the gift of a lifetime. So, you know, uh, but yeah, I'm going to stick with the answer that hopefully I haven't played him yet. Yeah. Mine's Jack Bauer as well. <laughs> I used to watch Keith Fur, I remember, and I be on the TV and, you know, same outfit, of course, and uh, so I enjoyed doing that. Quick, hurry. You both have also worked with a slew of amazing directors and amazing actors. Um, who's left the greatest impression on you? I mean, like, the rush with you and Jennifer Jason Lee, I think her and Ellen Burstyn are my favorite American actresses, who like drawing breath. Yeah, man, like who made the impact? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's been such a long time. But I mean, of course, you know, I worked with, uh, with De Niro and, um, and uh, Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall. And, um, you know, they were so into their characters, it just helped you to act. And I really responded to them that way. But, I, you know, I think as far as the, the largest impact, it's the deep relationships that you take from something. And so in that case, I mean, Kiefer and I were talking, I mean, you know, he's literally one of my oldest friends now, almost 35 years. So those are the things you take away, um, uh, more so than any kind of lesson or impression, I believe. Thanks, buddy. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> he said he was going to take his say back. that. <laughs> Next question. Hi, oh, my name's Kelly. It's nice to see both of you here. Um, my question's for Kiefer. Um, do you have a preference between filming movies and, or TV shows? Which do you prefer, and is one more difficult than the other? The job's the same. The job doesn't change. Uh, 
having said that, you know, when you make a film, if a film makes a hundred million dollars, it's considered a, a successful film. Uh, at ten dollars a ticket, uh, you're looking at ten million people saw the movie over a course of three months when it was out. You could do a show like 24, and 25 million people saw it on Tuesday. You know, and so if you're proud of the story that you're telling, and you want people to see it. Uh, my experience is that television is, you know, the fastest, most efficient way to do that. But the job of what an actor does, does not change from television to, uh, to feature films, it's a mechanism. Uh, and my experience in television has been fantastic. My question is for uh, both of you. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room would agree that The Lost Boys is one of the greatest motion picture soundtracks ever to hit Hollywood. But my question is, um, out of all, between the two of you, all of your movies have great soundtracks, Rush and Stand By Me and Young Guns and uh, Narc. Uh, if you were to pop in the soundtrack to one of your movies while you're cruising around town, which one would it be? Um. For a good time or a dying time? <laughs> good time. Yeah, for a good time. Then I guess it would have to be Lost Boys. Most yeah, of my other soundtracks involve me dying. <laughs> I, I'll, t I'll tell you a very funny story about the soundtrack for Young Guns 2. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so a lot of people wanted to be in Young Guns 1 because it was a western and no one was making them back then. Uh, Tom Cruise came out and we shot him off a roof and John Bon Jovi came out and I shot him in the street. And we put a beard on them and they come work for a day and then with John Bon Jovi we went out to dinner and had some drinks and we were sitting in a bar and John looked at Emilio Estevez and said I want to do the music for the sequel. And Emilio said, well, I don't know if there's going to be a sequel. And John just shook his head and said, there's going to be a sequel. <laughs> and, and we were drinking. We weren't paying attention. And you were not drinking, Kiefer. I was, I was drinking. I wasn't paying much attention. And John started writing stuff down on a napkin. And he wrote Blaze of Glory in 15 minutes on a napkin. And he pushed the napkins to Emilio and said, that's your first song. Oh, wow. And I thought, well, that's pretty arrogant. <laughs> Finished the movie, went back up to Montana, and John Bon Jovi, I'm going to the store to buy a TV or something, and John Bon Jovi's on all of the television singing Blaze of Glory. It was the number one song. I didn't realize it at the time. And I went, wow, that son of a bitch did it. <laughs> and, and it was the greatest ad campaign for Young Guns 2. And Emilio has those three napkins framed in his house. Oh, really? And, and it was the biggest hit Bon Jovi ever had. And, uh, and it was a great album. So I'm, I'm, instead of going with Lost Boys, I'm going to go with Young Guns, the soundtrack for Young Guns 2. Awesome. What a great question. I'm a soundtrack fanatic. So. And also, John Bon Jovi, one of the nicest guys in the world. Speaking of music, you play a little bit yourself. You even played here in town a while back at the Urban Lounge. Yeah. So, where does that sit with you as far as an actor? Is there one that you prefer? I mean, not to pit them against each other. I, I know a lot of times artists who paint and do other things, the mediums kind of support each other and, and fulfill the whole pie. It's all storytelling. So songwriting is storytelling. It's just from a very personal point of view and there's stories from my life. Uh, and the support that we've had over the last five years of touring has been extraordinary. And, and uh, I met a bunch of people here today that have come, came saw the show a couple years ago. And hopefully we'll be back through here in December. And see ya. Keep, so keep your ears open, right? Um, speaking of other parts of your life, Jason, what gets you up in the morning besides your work? What things drive you? A very loud nine and a half year old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Superman. All right. Great to meet you. Big fan here. Um, I just wanted to tell you, um, or ask you actually, how do you make these characters keep her so so believable? I mean, I, I I went to work half asleep every almost every day when I watched 24. How do you make these characters? You went from Jack Bauer to be the president of the United States. 
How do you prepare? It's all in, in how you perceive the writing. Uh, and so for me, and, and I think Jason will tell you that every actor does this differently because it's such a personal thing. But for me, I try to find the thing that speaks the most truth to me. Uh, whether it's the integrity of a character, whether it's the physicality of a character, whether it's the intention of a character. And once I find that thing that I think is the most honest in the writing, uh, I lean into that and develop the character around that. Uh, I'll tell you something that's, that's really funny, and, and you won't hear actors say this. We could not do what we do if it was not for the willingness of an audience to suspend their own disbelief. And so what I mean is we're in a partnership, and, and what you said to me was incredibly gracious. I'm going to create a character and, and do the best I can to find something honest, but if you're not willing to kind of receive it, it's not going to work. And so to actually everybody in this room and everybody that we've met at the tables today, that's a partnership we share, and, and your willingness to kind of accept a story that we're trying to tell you is as important as our commitment to trying to tell it. It's a partnership that we share. So thank you all for that. Yeah. Because Roger Ebert's uh, movies are empathy machines. They're empathy machines. When you go and engage with a film, like I, you see it a lot with like horror kids. They'll cross their arms and they'll be like, prove it to me. I actually stood up at a screening of The Exorcist and chided these guys for doing that. I said, this is tragic. Engage with it. Be empathetic. You'll enjoy it. Great costume, by the way. Thank you. Hi guys. So I am a huge Three Musketeers fan. And that cast was just phenomenal. I got to work with so many amazing people, um, particularly Tim Curry. And I just wondered if you had any fond memories or stories from filming that. <laughs> well, you can't do a film with Charlie and not have some memories. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story, and he, and he wouldn't have a problem with me telling, telling this. Uh, most of us went to fencing school for about three months to prepare for doing that film, and Charlie never went. And we were doing a fencing sequence, and Charlie didn't know any of the moves, and we were using real swords. And three moves into the fencing sequence, he thought he could bluff his way through it, and then panicked and ran off because he thought he was gonna get killed. <laughs> and he was hiding behind a tree and he was really panicked, and, and the director, because I had known him for a long time, said, would you go talk to him? And so I did, and he said, man, they're gonna kill me. And the fencers, the other people that we were fighting, they were all Romanian, so they didn't speak English, so he couldn't even say stop. You know, and so I go behind the tree and I, I say, look, man, we got to shoot this. we got to figure something out. And he said, man, they're going to kill me out there. And I said, well, you should have gone and studied. And he's like, yeah, tell me something I don't know. So he got all upset. So anyways, what they worked out is they worked out two moves for Charlie and then he punched the guy in the face. Right? And that was the end of his fight sequence. Four months later, the film's finished and we go to see the movie. Three months of training, and I'm looking at the fencing sequence, and I'm going, wow, that's, that's pretty good, and da, da, da. And then they cut to Charlie, and he does his two moves, and he punches the guy in the face, and the crowd goes nuts. <laughs> and that's when I wanted to be Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Welcome to Salt Lake. Thank you. Um, really quickly, big fan since Lost Boys were talking. Anyway, um, so when working with Sally Field in Eye for an Eye, um, that last scene with Sally Field, how difficult was that for you? And I mean, was that it was the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, I played played the worst character of all time, and, and and unless you really played that character, the rest of the film wouldn't work. Um, I physically assaulted two women in that film. Uh, it, was, it was the worst. I have two daughters. Uh, but I felt that the story was really important to tell. And that was the part that was right for me. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was really, really difficult. And, and I have to tell you, uh, one of the things that I'll respect and love about Sally Field forever was she knew how hard it was. And she was so encouraging and empathetic 
about what I had to go through and what the other women who were the victims of, of those crimes, what they had to go through. Uh, she was amazing through that. But that, there was a, it was the hardest job. And if, there's, if I had to look back on one job that I maybe could have let go and not have done, that would have been it. How do you let it go after you play a role like that when you go home at night? I mean... Oh, come on, man. I'm a drinker. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Well, fellas, I've um, been watching you since as long as I can remember. Um, this question is more of a technical question. Um, Going from being an actor to a director, and then director to actor, what skills, mindsets do you find most valuable to take that way so that you can communicate to actors or to directors? The creative process for me, I'm always going to approach from the perspective as a, of an actor. Uh, it's how I'll block the scene, it's why I'll choose what camera angles and everything else. Uh, the biggest task of directing outside of the creative prospect or perspective again, which I will approach from what I experience as an actor, uh, is people management, is hiring the right people to do their jobs and then letting them do that. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems I've seen with first-time directors is they try to do everything. Uh, somehow they're the best clothing designer and the best cinematographer and the best writer, and, and you're not. Uh, so it's, it's, it's management skills more than anything. And then from a creative process, again, it's always going to be seen through the lens of what I would look at as an actor. Thank you, fellas. Cheers. Great question. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, my wife is up here earlier answered my question, so I got another one. Um, and it's for both of you. Um, is there a role you almost got to act or always dreamed of? And at the end of your question, Keeper, could you uh, dramatically take your glasses off and yell, damn it? Yell what? And yell, damn it? Sure. <laughs> is there a part you ever? No. Well, okay, this is, this is actually funny, and I don't even know if I've, I think I've told Jason this. Uh, but he did an amazing movie uh, about Afghanistan and the war back in the day in a, in a tank. <laughs> and, I, and, and he was brilliant in that film, and, but I wanted that part really bad. Yeah, and I wanted it really bad. And, uh, and it went to my best friend. You, know? you talking about The Beast? Yeah. What a movie, oh my gosh. So, so I think that's probably happened more to me than it has to Jason. I think there's, you know, there's, there's a few things that I've seen come across my desk that I've really wanted to do and, and hasn't worked out. And, it, and in the long run, certainly over 40 years, it's, it's made me really grateful for the opportunities that I have had. Uh, and for all the parts that I didn't get, damn it! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Again, I, I, I could be wrong, but didn't you beat out Jim, Jim Carrey for your role in Lost Boys? Not that I'm aware of. That's, that's what I hear. I think the thing is, when you get the part, you have no idea about who was coming up behind you. Yeah. What a different world it would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Thank gosh it worked out the way it did, though. Your question, please. Hello. My name is Janice, and I'm a big fan of both of you. I've seen all of your films. I'm a solution of that. But um, you did two films, one each of you, Flatliners and Sleepers. And Sleepers? Sleepers. And I just wanted to know what your take is, and you can give me the PC version and the movie version of Revenge versus Forgiveness. One more time, Revenge what? Revenge versus Forgiveness. Revenge versus Forgiveness, great question. Well, for me, Flatliners was a hard, hard movie for me at first to make because I thought we were gonna do something really serious and kind of mirror film called The Paper Chase, and then it was going to be realistic, and, and I remember running through a set, and there was like the Statue of Liberty's head, and a big box with 50 gloves sticking out of it for no reason at all, and then we get to the lab, and it looked like a Billy Idol concert, not a, a place that, so the reality of that really threw me, and Joel Schumacher, who also directed Lost Boys, had said, you're going to have to trust me. 
And he'd been so great to me that I really didn't have a choice. And so I did. When I went to go see the movie, I absolutely, I loved it. And, and I know that's a weird thing to say about something that you've done, but I was so proud of what he did because he created a world that was unrealistic so that you could actually be involved in the fantasy that he was trying to tell you. And the, act, and the whole film was about forgiveness. And that didn't come off the page the way it did off the screen. And that was really about Joel. And so I was very proud to be a part of a film uh, that was about forgiveness and that that was something that was really important for all of us uh, in society to be able to share with one another. And then that saying sorry is not a bad thing. It doesn't make you weak. Uh, and I really love that message of that movie. Sleepers was another film I wanted to do. Um, look, I mean, I don't, we all struggle with vengeance and forgiveness all through our lives, and I don't think anyone can tell uh, anyone else in some moralistic sense um, which should reside within you. But to your question, I think that's the best thing about the most realistic movies because you can objectively view that struggle through someone else. And in something like Sleepers, a horrific thing happened to those boys and it, it maimed them for life. And they found an opportunity eventually for vengeance and they took it. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't have and I'm not saying that the people uh, that they enacted it upon didn't deserve it, because I believe they did. I mean, if I saw somebody molesting a child, I would kill them, period, the end, without a thought. Um, now, that being said, in a movie like Sleepers, what you get to witness is not one of those people were saved from that vengeance, not one. Um, there was not even an iota of, of relief and they actually suffered just as much, if not more, and if you remember, a couple of the characters ended up dying anyway. So uh, that's the best thing about cinema, that you can experience those things. I mean, look, everything's about streaming now, and everybody wants to control everything on their own, but the greatest thing about movies, and I hope they continue to exist in this sense, is that a thousand people are willing to go into a dark room with strangers and they want to laugh, and they want to cry elbow to elbow. The same people that wouldn't say hello if you're walking down the sidewalk desire to be with others that they don't even know, to experience something emotional. And that's the best thing about cinema, so I hope it stays. Yeah. You know, I grew up going to really rough neighborhood theaters in Oakland, and the films leveled the playing field. It's like everybody got along, it was a cultural Equalizer, absolutely cultural equalizer. And I mean, if you notice my shirt, all I do is go to the movies. The shared experience in a cinema is, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps was talking about it. It's something I'm so worried about going away. Please go to the movies and support independent cinema too. The Broadway, right down the street. Go see stuff there. Um, we only have one minute and 45 seconds later, so super quick question, please. All right, um, it's uh, a question for you. Um, my mom wants to know if... You don't have to speak faster, don't worry. We're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, it's the TV show, The 24 Hours. Um, my mom was wondering if you ever got hoarse when you were yelling so much all the time. I did, actually. Uh, yeah. Tell your mom she was absolutely right. And, and there were, there were, it, it, it was a very weird thing because I've, I've got a pretty strong voice. Um, but there were moments that I, for the very first time in my career, and it wasn't until about season four or five, that I realized if I kept doing a scene this way, I would really only have three or four more takes left. Uh, so yeah, I had to watch out for that. And I love your hat. Thank you. You're welcome. What a great last question. Thanks everybody. FanX 2019. Thank you guys so much for having us. Bless your heart. Everybody, can you please give a huge round of applause for Jason Fabian and Kiva Sutherland? <laughs>